Um, so I think we've got you all here. Um, you'll notice that you are all muted. Um, it's not because we're not interested in what you've got to say, but because when we have 50 to 100 people talking at once, it's very hard to um, to hear everybody. Um, so before I hand over to Mieta, a very quick bit of housekeeping. For those of you who are now familiar faces on a Wednesday lunchtime, apologies, you'll have heard this before, but we are recording uh, this session. We put these up on YouTube so that you're able to watch again or that um, other members who haven't been able to join us live are able to catch up on what we're talking about. So if you don't want to be on our video, you have the option to turn your video off. Um, there's a stop video button at the bottom left of your screen um, do that and then you won't appear anywhere and there's no worry um, For those of you with snazzy backgrounds keep your videos on there. Great. Um, I'm looking at you Tom Flanagan uh, We will have a little time for Q&A afterwards um, But Miata does need to get off at half past fairly promptly So keep questions short and we will get through more if you want to ask a question There is a participate button at the bottom middle of your screen and you can use that to put your hand up. I will keep a monitor on whose hands are up. And um, we're also monitoring the chat. You can chat to me directly, to the cooperative party, which is my colleague Izzy, um, or to everybody. And please keep it clean, but you can put questions there as well, um, or, or flag that you want to say something. We probably won't get through all of them, and apologies if we miss you this time. I'll try and uh, get a spread of questions on. And the last thing is, if Mieta flags anything, a particular note for you to look up afterwards, um, I'm sure she'll be able to pass it on for us to send to you when we're done. And I think I've rattled through that in record time. Um, for those of you I don't know, I realise I haven't introduced myself. I'm the policy officer at the Cooperative Party, um, and I will hand over to Miata, who is the chief executive of the New Economics Foundation. Um, he's a huge wealth of experience and has done some really exciting work with the Cooperative Party previously, a great friend to everybody who wants to create a better economy where wealth and power are shared. So we're thrilled to have her today. Um, and I'll hand over to Miata, who will be much better at introducing what she's going to talk about and some of the themes uh, herself. So over to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm absolutely delighted to be joining all of you uh, this afternoon, virtually via Zoom. Um, and I thought I'd sort of reflect on the economics uh, of the pandemic um, and say a little bit about um, our kind of analysis of both the, the space, the window uh, to drive change and indeed the risks, um, and then a little bit about the work that we at the New Economic Foundation um, are doing um, and that we're hoping that others will sort of come on the journey with us. Um, I think what's becoming very, very clear is that, you know, the pandemic is a public health crisis first and foremost, but it is rapidly uh, turning into an economic crisis of uh, unprecedented scale. We are already in recession, we know this, um, and if you take uh, the Office for Budget Responsibilities assessment as your starting point, you know, they are predicting this quarter a 35% drop um, in economic uh, activity, uh, that over the course of this year that we're likely to see GDP fall by about 13%, which is the biggest single year drop in 300 years. Um, we are expecting unemployment levels of the sort that we haven't seen since uh, the 1980s. Uh, they project somewhere in the region of about a two um, million people rising um, in unemployment. Now, what I would say about the OBR's assessment is that it's probably quite optimistic because they assume that there was a three month lockdown and at the end of that, all things bounce back um, and the economy starts working in the way that it was before and everything's okay. And the truth of the pandemic from everything that we're seeing is that this is likely to continue because even when we are out of lockdown, uh, there will be some form of social distancing in place for some time. Um, and so the reverberations on the economy, I think, are going to be far more sustained than they are predicting. You know, our own assessment is that we are headed um, into a recession that isn't, you know, the V is the massive dip and then we come back up. Uh, we don't see this. We think that we are headed into a recession that will be deep, but is likely to also be sustained. Uh, and I think, you know, what the economics are doing is it's sort of shining a spotlight 
on some of the profound structural problems of our economy that we know existed before that. Um, problems that have been there and in some respects have maybe been swept underneath the carpet because if you look at many of the kind of fundamentals about our economy, it was already in crisis before this. And I think what's happening now is that all of that is being exposed in a way um, that it just wasn't before. And, you know, we already had an economy in which living standards uh, had pretty much stagnated. So since 2008, uh, living standards have not moved. In fact, you know, just before the pandemic hit uh, the recession, you know, living standards were worse than they were in 2008. We already had about 14.5 million people who were living in poverty in this country. We had people who were living hand to mouth, paycheck to paycheck, and the difficulties that they now go into an economic crisis with no cushion, no room to maneuver, uh, no way to kind of weather the storm that's coming. And I think it's shining a spotlight on the precarity of work for so many people. Um, and it's not just the 5 million people who are either self-employed or people in the gig economy that have been shown to be hugely vulnerable um, through the kind of economic fallout from this, but it's also the teams of employed people uh, that have and will be laid off relatively quickly, relatively easily, because rights and protections and collective power has been eroded over decades. I think it's shining a spotlight on the cost of austerity um, and, you know, health and social care, which is at the absolute front line of this pandemic, have been hugely underinvested. Social care in particular, particular over the last 10 years, social security, the safety net that was supposed to be there for all of us has been cut by 35 billion pounds since uh, the start of the decade. And, you know, out of work payments now, at about 15% of average earnings, are worth less than they have been worth at any point since the creation of the welfare state. And I think the inadequacy of the social safety net uh, is not only, you know, expo being exposed, but as its ranks swell, as unfortunately more and more people are having to rely on universal credit. So the numbers in the first few weeks were absolutely staggering, 1.2 million people within two weeks. But I think as, you know, as more people are forced to rely on 90 odd quid a week in order to kind of get by, the absolute paucity, you know, that, you know, millions have had to deal with, I think will become viscerally clear in a way that I think will put pressure on the government. And, you know, my sense is that as these things are being exposed and as, you know, the government is coming under pressure and is already coming under pressure to take unprecedented action to respond in ways that quite frankly are tearing up the old rule book. You know, it's showing that things that we were told were impossible that couldn't be done are suddenly being done because they have to be. It's challenging the mainstream and it's making ideas that were too radical, too taboo, uh, not quite unacceptable, suddenly acceptable. Um, and I think, you know, the combination of the sort of profound changes that we're about to see in our economy, um, in addition to the fact that actually as a result of the pandemic and the vulnerabilities that we're seeing, we're having to rip up the way that we did things. We're having to reimagine and rethink how we respond economically. All of that is creating the space for something different, possibly something different to come out of the other side of this. And for us to build back better from where we were. And I think if we are to recover in a way that takes us you know, to a path to something that is better and a different type of economy. And you know, what I think is quite interesting is that of course there will be people that want us to revert back to the old normal, people that we want us to revert back to business as usual. And you know, their numbers are actually dwindling. You know, I, I, the, the, the pace at which the debate is shifting, I find absolutely phenomenal. And you know, all the polling is suggesting that actually the broad majority of the public want something profound to come out of this. They want change. They don't want a reversion back to the old normal. And you know, the kind of politics you know, across the political spectrum, you know, even you know, commentators on the conservative side are saying there has to be a reckoning. You know, the inequalities, the vulnerabilities, the frailties in our economy are being exposed. 
in a way that is shocking and we have to do something to respond coming out of this crisis. And I, and I thought there was a really fascinating piece um, by the Financial Times about three weeks ago by the editorial board, which literally could have been written by the New Economics Foundation. Um, and, and it essentially said that, you know, the frailties that are being exposed by the pandemic are, you know, requires a reckoning. And actually, you know, the policies that have dominated for the last 40 years need to be rethought. And, you know, ideas that were taboo, you know, universal basic income, your know, wealth tax, uh, you know, corporatizing parts of the economy, all of that needs to be on the table. And that was coming from the FT. So it feels like there is something happening um, and it feels like the public debate is shifting. But if we are to kind of, stick, let that stick, lock that in, it does require those that fundamentally believe that we need profound change in the way our economy works to mobilize in order to win the recovery. And there will be a fight and there will be a debate, but we must mobilize in order to win the recovery. So that out of it comes a new social settlement that means that, you know, never again are we so vulnerable as a society, never again will we denude basic services that are absolutely foundational and fundamental to all of us. You know, never again will we rip up our social safety net so there are gaping holes through which people are going to have to fall. You know, out of it will hopefully come a chance to rebuild a different type of economy, one in which we pour huge amounts of investment into communities to try to fix age-old inequalities, where we're trying to invest in kind of better paid uh, work for people, um, as well as boost incomes at the low end. And I thought, I think the debate that's uh, raging at the moment about the value that we have placed on people like care workers, who are absolutely essential and yet are the lowest paid people in our society, and the need to rebalance that, I think in that is a space and opportunity to think about the value we pay on work and how that is reflected um, in how people are paid. And then for me, you know, the really interesting piece about how we shift the composition of the economy, because for us, it's not just about uh, a social settlement or, um, or uh, equality, it's about a democratic economy as well, uh, which is where the cooperative movement has always uh, been kind of located. I think there is a space as, you know, the government is about to, face the prospect where it is having to prop up pretty much every sector of the economy and the requests for bailouts are going to be phenomenal so we've already seen it from public transport from the trains through aviation retail it's not going to stop because the crisis is not going to stop and so there's a question for how do you bail out what's your framework what are you thinking about what are the values that sit within that and the thing that we are arguing is actually there are certain sectors that are absolutely foundational um, social care being one, um, that, you know, when the government thinks about the support, it ought to be thinking about how you attach immediate financial support with the opportunity to corporatize some of these sectors. Um, so the state steps in, you bail out, you take an equity share, and then you pass that equity share to the cooperative sector, either through employee ownership or through community ownership, in order to expand the space for us to collectively um, have democratic ownership over parts of the economy. But also, you know, there will be the need and the ability for the government to step in to support lots of businesses. And the mistake that we made in 2008 is that there was huge amounts of taxpayer money that was pumped into the financial sector, for example, with very little required in return. And actually, there ought to be conditionality that says, of course, of course, we will collectively, as taxpayers funding the government, step in to support. Um, our economy, but in return, actually out of this must be a new social settlement where businesses lock in social and environmental outcomes and responsibilities so that out of this we all operate in a different way. And there is a space and opportunity that we have and we must kind of push for. And I think the final piece for me is, you know, arguably I think one of the most profound lessons that will come out of this um, is how we use the recovery to prepare for, if you like, the next crisis that's coming in the form of climate change. 
Um, and the difficulty with climate change is we know that it's there, we know that it's real, um, but it feels very remote. Uh, and when we say something that is unprecedented is about to happen, actually that just feels like a million miles from people's day to day. And I think what the pandemic has done is that it's kind of given us the taste of what a crisis that is absolutely unprecedented feels like where we're having to do things that, you know, a few months ago, none of us thought would be possible, acceptable, palatable, and we're having to do it, and we're having to respond, and we're having to see change, profound change incredibly quickly. And that is how it will feel when we are in the eye of the storm of the climate crisis. And so I think there is the opportunity, and I hate using that word, but maybe there is a responsibility that is a better word to say now that we know what it feels like to be in an unprecedented crisis and you know the government's mantra of we will do whatever it takes is right we must do whatever it takes to prepare ourselves and steal ourselves for the next big thing that is coming which is climate change and so you know if we can lock these things in out of this, a new social settlement, um, you know, with the kind of foundational services, public collective services underneath that, uh, the drive to tackle some of the inequalities and the vulnerabilities that have been exposed through the pandemic, but also preparation. You know, we weren't prepared this time, not enough, and we've got to learn the lessons so that we are prepared next time. That feels like that is the, the window for us to lock something in. Um, that could take us on a pathway to a different sort of economic settlement coming out of this. Um, and, you know, at NEF, this is the main focus of our work now. Um, and what we are trying to do is two things. Uh, the first is, you know, the mantra of building back better is starting to bubble up. Um, and actually from all sources, from the IMF to the World Bank, uh, you know, as well as, you know, grassroots activists like Green New Deal UK. The idea of building that better is something that I think is tapping into where the public mood is. But for it not to just be a kind of a momentary thing and then we revert back to the old normal, it feels like there has to be an alliance of powerful voices that are there calling for it, trying to build public pressure and support on the government to recover in a way that does exactly that. Um, and so we are trying to put our efforts into thinking about how can we play our part in terms of mobilizing that coalition, that alliance, um, and helping it with some of the ideas that we think are absolutely critical in terms of ensuring that we shape the recovery in a particular way. Um, so the powerful voices, the alliance, the movement that can come behind this, but then actually the ideas of prospectus that allows us to have a recovery plan that can start to shift and transform our economy. Um, and, and so, you know, we hope that this will be the basis of a kind of big campaign and we hope that we can work in partnership with others, uh, both on the progressive side, but actually across the political spectrum, because this is no longer a question of left or right or progressive or not progressive. You know, it feels like there is a consensus as a ground scholar, which we can tap into and build out of. And it feels like if we can get this right and we can play our part uh, in terms of trying to win the recovery, then potentially there is some light at the end of what is the darkness of this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got a short time for questions. Thanks for those who have sent in some comments and thoughts already. Uh, we have had a real mixture from WASPy Women through to what we do about the national living wage and how we can and reshape that um, through to the role of adult learning. Um, I will call on um, Norman, who has patiently had his hand up to ask uh, a question first. You're unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, good. Um, thanks very much, Matthias, for the wonderful uh, survey of the present situation. Very interesting, very worthwhile. Congratulations. Um, I have a question, really. Do you think that uh, as a result of this uh, pandemic, there is the danger of a move towards greater to, to, uh, to greater centralization, that more, hand, more power is going to be placed in the hands of central government, possibly even leading to some kind of authoritarianism? And uh, sort of as an example of this, um, before the uh, pandemic, or after the 2008 uh, crisis, uh, there was an understanding that the, the state had already become the banker of last resort. Now there is talk about the state becoming the employer of last resort. I mean, do you think this is necessarily a good thing, or are there dangers in it? 
Okay. Thank you. And I will bring in Steph Cryan. You're not muted anymore. Uh, thanks, thanks, Anna. and thank you, Matt. I think it's really, really some really great information in there. Um, I'm cabinet member for um, jobs, business, and innovation at Suffolk Council. And one of the things we're doing at the moment is looking at what could recovery look like, working very closely with our business improvement districts and key anchor institutions. And I totally, and I totally agree with everything you said around the, the sort of the deep recession and the risk to employment, and, and particularly apprenticeships, which really worries me. But I just wondered, what are your thoughts on whether we then go into a period of recovery when we get another peak and there's another period of lockdown followed by recovery and there's like a stop start to the recovery? So I, I'm just wondering what the EMS sort of thinking and, and factors into that. Are. Great, thank you. And I had a question on the chat from Steve Morris. I'll unmute you in case you want to ask yourself, Steve. Are you there? Oh, sure, yeah. There yeah. we are. Uh, Hello. Hi. Yeah, so... Um, um, I'm not sure I'm going to ask the question too, actually, but, but um, I'm a bit of a hardcore eco-warrior. And I'm, for me, I think the, um, it's going to be a real struggle post-COVID. Uh, there's going to be a shortage of jobs. The economy is obviously going to get absolutely hammered. Um, a lot of big corporates are looking at more automation to try and kind of, for the future, because they want more resilience, less dependence on people. So... There's never a better opportunity for push for the biggest green deal we can get. You know, with, with the UK as uniquely placed as the most geographically advantageous place for um, for green energy, certainly in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, are, do we have a Green New Deal at the top of the kind of list of, re of requirements? I mean, there was an article in the in the Guardian yesterday from a report. I uh, I've seen you sent the article through. I might circulate that and just get another question in because I'm conscious of time, if that's okay. Yeah. So, so you know, for, just from my perspective, I mean, uh, you know, where do you, where do you put the Green New Deal in, in terms of priorities? For me, it should be top of the list, but, you know. Fabulous. Thank you very much. And I will get uh, Mariana because I missed you last time and I feel bad about it. <laughs> thank you thank you um i i have a, a different question thank you very much for the presentation it was really um really useful um i think uh, one of the things that we all are obviously have been sick to death about before before this pandemic started was was brexit um but um and, and, I, and I you know I have to I have to own up to being a hardcore Remainer, but um, given the situation of of the the global pandemic and the effect of of the economy, um, w should we still be um, sleepwalking into a No Deal Brexit when you know at best we were we were predicting a five percent dip on our GDP? Given the situation that we find ourselves in, should we be braver about talking about the absolute folly of Brexit, given where we are now? Great, thank you. Meet you back. Um, for okay to get on with Miata. Yes, brilliant. Really Fabulous. great. Wide ranging, so that should probably uh, fill your fill your brains and, and time for a little while. Brilliant. Uh, no, really, really great question. Um, uh, I think Norman, your question is uh, very, very salient because I, I generally think that there is a risk um, of big centralisation. We're already seeing it, and actually, one of the interesting things I've found is. Um, the response has been very, very much about national government. Um, and actually, you know, the, uh, uh, when this hit, I was like, of course, you've got to chuck loads of money at local government and local players in order to try to help stem uh, both the public health crisis, trying to help people who are in self-isolation or people who are shielding. And I've been quite taken aback by how little of that there has been. There has been some, but not nearly at the scale. And it has all been through kind of national command and control. So I think that is definitely a risk. And there is a pathway that we end up with a far more centralized, I mean, that's even possible, um, government and society than we had before. Why I have some cause for hope is when we shift into the recovery space, and the truth is that the economic part of this, rather than the public health part of this, which is easier to do through command and control, um, will hit different parts of the country very differently. Um, and, you know, just the basics of, you know, London and the southeast, actually about half of its workers are able to um, work from home. And so there will be some kind of cushion to the economy. If you look at somewhere like Burnley or Stoke, it's 
something like 10%, 20%, it's much, much lower. So the economic impact is going to be variable and therefore the response will have to be variable. And with all the will in the world, central government yanking whatever levers it wants to yank is just not going to be able to imprint on different parts of the economy. And that is where I think there will be the space because I think part of the story about our recovery will be about, yes, national measures, um, of which big investment will be part of that, but it will be about action on the ground. It will be about local authorities working with their partners, working with their local businesses, thinking about how they drive a transformation of their local economies. Um, and in order to do that, if the government wants to move quickly and wants to recover quickly, it's going to have to shed some power and resources at the local level to allow that to happen. Now, I, I'm, a, I'm biased. I'm a, uh, I, I'm a kind of uh, localist. And so maybe I've got Royce to do glasses about how this will play out. But I just don't see how we can find a pathway out of what we're about to go through unless there is a sharing of responsibility between the kind of national um, and the local. I think, you know, the government has been given unprecedented powers um, and uh, which, you know, if you're a libertarian, you would be nervous about. Um, I think some of the surveillance powers that have been necessary through this um, are worrying. Um, I, but, but it's not clear, not least that actually because we have quite a libertarian minded government that will be sitting in, whether it will choose to, if you like, exploit that um, and go down that track. I think the natural instinct, quite frankly, of Boris Johnson is a libertarian. This is why he found the lockdown so difficult. This is why he delayed so long. Um, and so I think there, there will, it will, it's unclear how it will play out. Um, but, but I think the instincts means that they are likely not to kind of try to kind of overextend some of the powers in which they've um, acquired. Um, I think, Stephanie, your uh, question about uh, the recovery and stop start, I think that's what, exactly what it's going to look like. Um, I suspect, and this is why I think the recession is going to be quite um, sustained rather than a kind of short, sharp up and then we bounce back. Because what we're likely to see until a vaccine becomes, you know, widely available is periods of like sustained periods of social distancing. So if you just think about businesses and small businesses in particular, in something like retail or hospitality, demand for those sectors is not going to return back anytime soon. So there is going to be a sustained recession in those parts um, of the economy, which are big, big chunks and big employers, uh, which will feed up, feed into unemployment, etc. But even for parts of the economy that can go back to normal, you know, so the government's talking about construction going back to normal quite quickly, what we're likely to see is, uh, you know, as, as we see a spike um, in uh, the rates of contraction, the government probably has to pull back. And we're likely to see this kind of going back and forth for some time, meaning that a sustained recovery will be quite hard um, to, to lock in. Um, and that will put a huge onus uh, on the government to continue to intervene. Uh, and Norman, I missed your point about an employer of last resort. Um, and so I, I, in the short term, it is, you know, six million people are being followed and propped up by the government. Um, and every intervention, every bailout is essentially the government propping up employees and businesses because in the end they want to protect jobs because they don't want the scarring effect of mass unemployment. Um, now, I don't think that's going to sustain itself because I think this government finds that deeply uncomfortable. And we've already seen indications from Rishi Sunak that they're trying to roll back furloughing and moving it from a kind of 80% subsidy to 60% and kind of pull it back. Uh, but I do think there's a really important role for the government to provide a social safety net. Um, and whether that's done by trying to kind of bolster wages in the short term, or it's done through a proper social security system, which is a thing that we're absolutely lacking. And the bit of analysis we did was, you know, job retention scheme, great. The support to self-employed people, great. But there are about almost 6 million people who fall through the cracks of that. And at the moment, they're falling through the cracks and they're having to rely on 90 pounds a month. And that is a week rather. And that is just not good enough. So we have to think about how we bolster the social security to allow people to transition from work in what will be a really choppy time, but also to help people while they're out of work. Um, and, you know, I suspect in some sectors where the government is propping it up, it will have to take over those sectors. And what we will be desperately calling for is do not nationalize and take everything and try and run. I don't think they will. It's not in the bent of this government. And perhaps if you had a Labour government, you'd have more of a kind of worry or risk of that. Don't try and take everything as a kind of national monolith that's run from the center. Use it as an opportunity for you know, the state to acquire 
equity or take over and then to pass it on, pass it on to employee through employee ownership, pass it on to cooperatives, community, diversify our economic base through this, rather than trying to either pull everything to the national or indeed just support without in any way trying to take any sort of democratic stake within this. Um, Steve, your um, question about uh, uh, the Green New Deal, absolutely. Um, so, you know, there are two things for us that are kind of key in the next phase. Uh, the government will have to make a choice, and I think they've already indicated which way they will lie, between whether, you know, the OBR predicts that at the end of this year we're going to have a de deficit of about 218 odd billion. Uh, that's pretty much a fourfold increase from where we were um, at the start of um, before this uh, crisis. And, you know, the voices of austerity are already starting to uh, sing. Uh, and the government will make it, have to make a choice about whether they are scared by that scale of a deficit, which granted is, you know, it is a huge deficit. But what we're arguing is it's a huge deficit, but the cost of financing it, the cost of financing capital is at historical lows. It is lower this year than it was last year. It is lower than it has been in any point, uh, you know, since the sort of Second World War. So if you're going to do it, this is the point to do it. Um, and that is the thing that matters. But, you know, so rather than retrenching back to austerity, actually you should be thinking about a fiscal stimulus. And if you're about to do a big fiscal stimulus, which I think they're going to have to to prop up the economy, by goodness, make it green. Like make it green so that you are using both an intervention that's looking to bolster the economy as a way to help us transition for the next crisis. And, you know, in fairness, the things that we're picking up from uh, the Treasury and Bayes is that they're thinking about a green fiscal stimulus. Um, and so, you know, that becomes, the, if you like, the first piece of a Green New Deal and thinking about the social settlement, thinking about the way that you kind of create jobs that are well paid are all part of the Green New Deal. We change the language. Uh, because uh, so that it feels relevant to the moment, but fundamentally the things that sat behind the Green New Deal are absolutely paramount. And what we're, what we're hoping, and again, I hate, hate using that word, is, and some of the polling that we've seen on this is quite interesting, where the public are now, we weren't prepared for Corona. We can't afford to be not prepared for future crisis. And if you can lock that sentiment in as a way to then say, fine, let's use the way that we cover it as a way in order to prepare. Um, and then uh, finally, Mariana, your, your point about Brexit. Um, so obviously it's folly. Um, obviously when we are in the midst of, you know, one of the deepest recessions um, that we have, to embark on anything like a no deal Brexit would be complete folly. Um, and in the end, I, I think the government does know this. And this is where the politics versus the reality will play out for them. Um, because, you know, it is incredibly hard for all sides to try to negotiate a, a future relationship in the current context where everyone's firefighting anyway, to try to do it at timescales that were already pretty tight, um, I think is, you know, moving from ambitious to kind of plain old mad. Um, and I think they know this. I think it is posturing. So when it comes to it, um, and again, actually the public, you know, even uh, people who are, you know, the sort of pro-Brexit and Bre people who voted Brexit and passionately believe in it, wouldn't, would forgive a government that said, you know, quite frankly, we've got some bigger things to worry about. Um, and, you know, the project is still the project. We will leave, but we'll have to shift the timescales. Um, I think that's where they will end up. But, but to be honest, on this, you, uh, I can never read the government because there is what logic and, you know, all the good advice they'll be getting from official says. And there is the kind of very deep seated political project that is fundamentally ideological. Um, and if they choose to just follow the ideology on this and not listen to the kind of the reason and the, what, what the, the facts and the reality tell them, the cost will be huge um, because, you know, businesses were already struggling to prepare for Brexit. The idea that they can do that on top of trying to respond to the fallout of the coronavirus is just, it's for the birds um, and, and we will all pay a price. Um, and in the end, I think the politics of that, I hope is the thing that kind of focuses their minds. Brilliant. And I, I think uh, we've, we've kept you longer than, uh, than we promised. So I'm going to say... I also massive... spoke for too long in my response. <laughs> no, it was, it was hugely interesting. And, and there was such a wide range of questions. It's, it's hard to condense it down to a single answer. So thank you so much for 
um, your time and consideration. You sparked a really interesting debate in the um, Zoom chat about what that sort of taking equity in a company looks like, the idea of, you know, how does it differ from Thatcher's golden share? How do we cooperatize? How do we retain control over the long term? So lots and lots of sort of nitty gritty policy questions that I know cooperators love to get to grips with. Uh, governance is our favorite topic, I, I think sometimes. Um, but no, I want to say a massive thank you. Um, Miata writes and speaks about these things really regularly. So um, do look up other bits of work that she and the rest of the team at the New Economics Foundation um, are working on to keep yourselves up to date. Um, and hopefully some of those themes that she's touched on um, and your questions have touched on and, and apologies to all of the ones that we haven't got onto a topics we're going to be able to take forward and, and think about when we're shaping our new uh, sort of economic and social settlement. So a big sort of virtual round of applause and um, a big thank you. Enjoy your long weekend and your bank holiday um, and stay at home, stay safe and, and uh, try and stay sane. Thank you very much. <laughs>